Welcome to Edison TV. Today I'm talking to Joe Bowen, the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Metals Company. Uh, the Metals Company is a pioneer in the recovery of polymetallic nodules from the deep sea. These naturally occurring nodules contain significant amounts of nickel, cobalt, manganese, all essential for the production of batteries, which are driving the electrification of the transport sector. So, Joe, can you start by giving us an overview of TMC's activities and the investment proposition? Thanks, David. So, we're all about supplying a new low impact from both an environmental and societal perspective supply of battery metals. And they come in the form of like the one I'm holding in my hand, a polymetallic nodule. And they're located in the Pacific Ocean, about a thousand miles off the coast of Mexico. And they literally just lie on the ocean floor like this one in my hand. And the good news is that it's an area, uh, the abyssal zone, known as the abyssal zone. It's an area with no flora, like zero. Uh, the fauna is mainly bacteria that is uh, living amongst the sediment. And if you measure the amount of life down there, you're talking about 10 grams of biomass per square meter. So it's a, a, an area of very low energy because basically there's no food down there. Uh, the food that does reach it decomposes through the water column. And the beautiful thing about these nodules is that they happen to contain the metals we need to build batteries. So they're full of nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. And we've identified about 1.6 billion tons of them on two of our license areas. And, and that's enough to build around 280 million EV batteries, NMC battery cathodes on an 811 chemistry. And so what we've been busy doing for the last 12 years is the feasibility and uh, the pre-fees. So we've defined the resource. So we're compliant with the Canadian 43101 resource reporting standard. Uh, we've just completed uh, a very important pilot collector test, which basically demonstrated our production system. Uh, we also had another vessel at sea, which was monitoring the impact, did a pre-survey, uh, monitored what was happening during the production stage, and then stayed behind to monitor the impacts. And that was a very successful campaign. We were uh, we met all of our objectives, and that will the the results of that will then feed into our application that we will lodge with the regulator, the International Seabed Authority, uh, when we apply to move from the exploration phase into the exploitation phase. And so it's a big resource. And if you look around the world, what we're finding, of course, is that no one wants a mine in their backyard. And you only have to look at the United States that have uh, stopped the move forward of pebble, of, of uh, twin metals. It's very, very challenging to firstly find these resources and then to get them permitted. Uh, if we look as far as Indonesia, you've got indigenous communities being pushed out by the um, by the expansion of nickel laterite mining. And so a deposit a thousand miles from the nearest community, 4,000 meters below sea level, seems to be a really good place to locate a deposit of this nature. That's great. Talk a little bit more about the licensing process. Uh, in particular, you know, 2023 is going to be a big year for that. It is. It is. So we at the moment have what are um, exploration licenses, the same as you would have with a terrestrial deposit. And that provides us with the right to apply for an exploitation license over that same defined area. And we have three license areas in total. Uh, each of them are sponsored by three developing nations, Nauru, Tonga and Kiribati. Now, there's one missing piece to the jigsaw and that is the final exploitation code and it was on schedule to be adopted by 2020 but then came COVID, so that caused some delays but it's on schedule to be adopted in the second half of this year and so that will then allow us to lodge our application to move from exploration to the exploitation phase now the International Seabed Authority is an intergovernmental organization it's represented by um, 100 67 member states, countries, plus the European Union. And they were mandated by the Convention of the Law of the Sea. And the convention uh, empowered the International Seabed Authority to put in place exploration and exploitation regulations while maintaining the marine environment. 
And so they have a very clear mandate and we're coming up to the, the final chapter. So it's a very exciting time in this industry. And, you know, we're, we're leading the charge. You say that final chapter, I mean, that really is this year, isn't it? The sort of July this year is, um, is it the is. time. Yeah, that's right. No, it's, um, and, and, you know, rarely has an industry ever had so much scrutiny before it's got started. You know, if we look at the oil and gas or the mining industry, they tend to get started and then you try and regulate them. Whereas this has been very different. I mean, the ISA was established in 1994 and here we are 2023. And so it's slow, but it's very thoughtful. And, you know, the fact that there has been so much debate, that there has been so much research, you know, our company alone has spent, you know, approaching a thousand days at sea focused on environmental studies, focused on resource definition. So there's been there's been a lot of work, not only by us, but by other contractors since the, uh, well, since the 1970s. So just to expand on that a bit more, I mean, obviously the recent you know, significant sea trials, the, the environmental concerns that are out there, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you're sort of what we can expect from you this year in terms of the results from the sea trials, um, academic papers, etc. Mm. Well, it's interesting because the things that the environmental groups are concerned about are exactly the same things that we're concerned about. What will be the impact of removing these nodules from this environment? Uh, what will be the impact of the sediment plume? You know, it's like driving a car down a dirt track. You, you kick up some dust. The question is, how far will it travel and how much dust? And the only way you can get an accurate answer to that is by doing the work, by actually completing the science. And so that's why we're very excited to, to have had such a successful campaign last year. We've been gathering baseline data and other environmental data for many, many years, but it all came to a, a, a conclusion by having our collector system out there with an end-to-end -end trial which allowed us to to monitor those impacts, to monitor the sediment, to be able to monitor the midwater uh, plume that is generated. And so we feel very confident that firstly, the, the the observations at first pass were at the bottom end of our expectations. And so, you know, for example, speculation around this plume was that it might travel for hundreds or even thousands of miles, but it doesn't. What observations uh, at first hand is that it rises about two meters above the seafloor and it really sticks together like a cloud because the particles tend to flocculate together and they settle up to 98 percent of that settlement settles within a kilometer of the test area and so the the notion that this plume will travel long distances and impact large areas is proven to be wrong um but you've got to do the science to be able to provide those answers. And so, you know, we're very excited about the volume of scientific papers that will be released over the coming year as these results start to be uh, put together, as these results start to be published. And I think it's going to provide a lot of comfort to people, as it, as it will to us, of course, because, you know, we're looking for those answers as well. And, um, and the, the key is to be able to, to, to quantify what will be the impacts, how do we mitigate those impacts? And then we have to have a grown up conversation about trade-off. It's like, well, these are the set of impacts if we go and collect nodules from the, the CCZ. And how do they compare against the known set of impacts that are created by the current mining practices? And of course, you know, land-based mining has become more efficient. You know, there's no doubt about it, but there is some areas that are not efficient. And if you look at nickel as one of the key ingredients, about half of the economics come from nickel in our deposit. And of course, all of the growth in nickel production is coming out of equatorial rainforests from nickel laterites. And, and they are the most devastating form of mining known to man. You know, you're having to rip, if, if we imagine this uh, moss wall behind me was a you know, an established rainforest, you know, underneath it lies the nickel laterite. So to get to it, you've got to go down there and destroy all of that rainforest, releasing all of the sequestered carbon. You've got to dig up the soil just to get to the metal bearing ore. 
And so it's a devastating process. And, and of course, it generates an enormous amount of waste and tailings. And, you know, if you're an indigenous community living in that area where you've got to pack up and move. Um, so there's a lot of impacts that that people haven't fully assessed or thought about when it comes to land-based mining. And, 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 you know, to meet the energy needs as we move on this transition, the International Energy Agency estimates we'll need to increase mining by five to six hundred percent between now and 2040. So that's that's an enormous, you know, growth in extractive industry. And so we have to rethink of it. We have to find a better way than the current practices. And you know, we, we firmly believe that this is the better way. And talk a little bit about the operations. Um, obviously, you've had the sea trials. How your equipment worked in those sea trials. Mm. In the nodules, once you've got them up above sea level, what are you going to do with them then? Mm. Well, we're very fortunate to have attracted some quality partners and all seas who are one of our largest investors, but they also bring amazing operational experience. For the last 37 years, they've been operating in the deep ocean, uh, helping lay pipe for the oil and gas industry. And so, so they know what 24 seven production looks like, and they've been able to bring that expertise into this new industry. And for that reason, we had an amazingly successful pilot collector trial last year. Now, we collect them by literally uh, our robots crawl along the seafloor and using an engineering principle known as the Kawanda effect, we're able to lift the nodules. Uh, we spray a jet of water which hits the nodule and as the, the curvature of the collector head rises, it lifts the nodules. And of course, we then separate out the sediment, leaving it behind on the seafloor and then we pump the nodules to the production vessel. Then comes the job of what to do with them. And so we move them to shore where we will then process them. And, and I think that's one of the exciting parts about this project, because, of course, with a land-based uh, ore body, you have to do that work wherever the land-based ore body is. But, of course, generally, the gating item tends to be infrastructure. You have to build roads to get there. You have to build uh, power supplies, you have to build rail and deep water ports and communities for people to live in. So the, the amount of infrastructure required with these land-based projects is enormous. And something people often don't think about is once you start giving access to this area, that first road in has a big impact because that allows other extractive industries or agriculture creep and all these other things that have a, also have a devastating impact on the environment uh, to propagate. So the beauty of this project, of course, is that we're not hemmed in by any of that infrastructure. We will not be building deep water ports anywhere. Uh, we will make sure that we will build where we have a supply of renewable power. And in many cases, we'll try and reuse infrastructure that already exists, including in the processing of these nodules. And so you can expect some exciting news from the company this year uh, as we are progressing with our partners with regard to that onshore processing. Uh, it's a way that we can keep our capital investment uh, as light as possible. You know, if we can find existing processing plants that can process our nodules, and there are more than a handful, then that means we won't have to go and build the early processing plants. And that's gonna have a tremendous impact economically if we don't have to go and spend those hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And so expect to hear news on that uh, during the course of this year. Okay. Just, just finally, you know, it's the beginning of 23 now. Mm. Uh, when do you think we'll see the first car with a, a TMC battery in it? Well, we have, um, our plan remains the same to be in production by the end of 2024. And you know, now that we're in 2023, that's only next year. And so I think it's reliable to say by 2025, we'll have cars running around. And, and the beauty of that, of course, is that eventually I believe consumers will favor brands who produce their products with the lowest, plant, lo lowest planetary impact. And so being able to measure these impacts, whether it's the CO2 emissions that are generated, the amount of trees that were cut down, the amount of child labor that was used, you know, clearly none. You know, the fact that we will be able to measure that, I think will really put focus on other parts of the supply chain. And that's gonna make uh, battery metals from these nodules a, a clear winner. Yeah. 
thanks very much for your time and uh, we look forward to following your story with much interest. Thanks for your time today. I really enjoyed it.